Stephen Hughes was born in London and moved to Australia in 1997. Stephen lives in Brisbane and for many years has been a member of the Christadelphian Church or Ecclesia at North Brisbane. Stephen has a PhD in physics, which he received at King's College in London and for some years now has taught physics and maths at the University of Queensland. Stephen joins Wilderness Conversations. Stephen, you weren't born in Australia, but in London. Tell us about what brought you to Australia and how your career has developed in Brisbane. Okay, well, thanks, Steve. A bit of uh, background. As you say, I was born uh, overseas, born in London. My father was Australian. He's from Sydney, but went over to England, met my mother. So I was born over there. And so I didn't um, come over to Australia until fairly late in life. I was working as a medical physicist in London. I got married to Jane. She's from Adelaide. This is way back in 93. And so we lived in London for about three and a half years. And Jane wanted to come back to Australia. So I applied for jobs in Australia and ended up working or getting a job at a university in Queensland, Queensland University of Technology and was there for 19 years until when was it end of 2016 and then since that time i've been working at uh, a college which is affiliated with the university of queensland i'm I'm also uh, got a position at, at uq university of queensland and at the is college i teach what's called the foundation year university of queensland or uq foundation year to international students. I teach mostly physics, but also uh, uh, mathematics uh, as uh, as well. So that's what I've been doing. It's been quite challenging this year, as you can imagine. Um, some students are on campus and there's uh, a lot which are, are still overseas, mostly in China and other countries which can't come to Australia yet, but we're hoping that's gonna change soon. So they're doing the foundation year with an anticipation of coming to Australia in the next year, perhaps? Yes, well, the one group I've got now, we had face-to-face teaching for three weeks, then bang, everything got shut down due to COVID. You know, it happened, you know, space a week, everything went online. They came back, so they they were in Brisbane, um, but in the meantime, some actually went back to China because what happened, the tables turned where... COVID sort of produced in China, but then it came up in Australia. So some actually went back home and carried on online. Um, Some new students started, new students have been starting in the meantime, but they're over overseas. So the hope is that, um, well, hopefully at some point they will be able to come to Australia and uh, carry on with their their, their studies. So hopefully the uh, the industry, which is very important to Australia, the uh, education industry, can bounce back from this. Yeah, I hope, hope so. Yes. So in fact, some people are even hoping that there's a kind of a pent-up demand and extra students will come to Australia. They've been holding off. And as you will know, America is not an attractive proposition at the moment for higher higher education students, and and Europe isn't either, or the UK. So that that might boost the numbers coming to Australia. You've had a special interest in the cosmos, and it's something you've been studying over an extended period of time, that is the study of the universe. But you've got a particular interest in the moon. Uh, And I guess as far as the cosmos is concerned, the moon is is about as close to home as it gets. Mm. Um, But before we get onto the moon in particular, which I'd like to talk about, I'd like to just take one step back and just um, talk about um, the fact that you're a Christian, uh, but you're also a scientist, 
And I know some people um, see a contradiction in that. Some people wonder, can you be a, cri- a Christian as well as a scientist? So I'm interested in your um, perspective on this. With regards to the cosmos specifically, and how does it impact um, your belief and the reality of Christianity in your life? Yeah, thanks. Mate. Yeah, you're quite right. I think there's there's definitely a, a prevailing myth that you can't be a scientist and a Christian. Um, I've had a colleagues at work or a colleague at work came up to me once and said, you know, I don't know how you can teach what you teach um, and believe what you do believe. He, he was familiar with um, the things that I believed in. And I, I said to him in all honesty that to me there is absolutely no conflict. I, I, the two main courses I taught at university in astrophysics, there was one on stellar astrophysics, which is about um, uh, the stars, although it did include things about the sun, moon and the planets as as well. And the other course, which is more advanced, was on cosmology, which is to do with uh, the galaxies and uh, origin of the universe, that, that, that kind of thing. But I can honestly say to me, in my studies, this is over, you know, you know for two decades or more now, I suppose, is that it, it kind of went the other way with me. I've been amazed by the things which have been discovered and I just saw them as extra evidence that the that the universe has been especially designed for, uh, for, for life. Um, and, I mean, today we don't want to get into arguments about um, the origin of life on the earth, but sort of leaving that aside, just looking at the universe it, itself, irrespective of whether we believe that life was uh, created on this earth through special creation or um, it evolved or you know, other views about you know, cyst, evolution, all those different arguments. Now, even you know, leaving that aside, when we look at the universe, it looks like it has been especially designed mm. for life. And then the moon in particular, the moon in particular. In fact, there's a there's a, a verse which I uh, I particularly um, like, um, Psalm eight verse three. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. And so with that that verse there, um, the key thing I see in that is that the that the heavens everything in the heavens the moon in, included it looks like it's part of god's special design we all know that the the moon is not made of cheese but that's probably about all i know much about this i, I do know that it affects the tides but i i've got to admit that's probably about it so tell us a bit about what is so interesting about the moon to talk about the the, the tides and as you've pointed out i think uh Pretty much everyone know that the moon uh, controls the tide. If you go down to a beach at the same time each day, that the tide is, is is different. You know, it kind of goes in and in and out. And people probably know some places in the in the world have um, uh, really really high tides, and some have low tides. But what it is, in fact, this is not often. Un, un, understood um, there, there's lots of misconceptions just um, you know in the world of physics itself irrespective of any religious arguments there's a lot of misconceptions about how the tides are generated and I suppose the common one is that the moon acts like a kind of a, a vacuum cleaner where you, you know a vacuum cleaner can suck up a rug that what happens the moon kind of sucks up the oceans close to it um, and kind of pulls the earth into into that in, into the water, and so you get a bulge on both sides of the earth. Actually, what happens is that the um, the moon actually compresses the earth from the sides. In fact, a demonstration I often use is I blow up a, a spherical balloon, put it into a fruit net pull the fruit net and that's like 
the gravity of the moon squishing the earth and because the water moves more easily in the rock of the earth that squeezing effect actually pushes water forwards towards the moon and also away from the um from the moon if you imagine like a um a rugby ball shape or um cadbury's cream egg that's actually quite a good shape you know uh, you get that kind of um, that kind of oval shape. I mean, that, that, that's greatly exaggerated. On average, um, in the middle of the ocean, the um, the, the you know it's a, it's a meter or less. So it's only a very very small change. So if you're on a particular place on the Earth, you rotate into and then out of the tidal bulge. So another thing we all think if you're at the sea we think of the water coming in tide comes in then the tide goes out what is actually happening is the earth itself goes into the water and comes out so the earth goes into the tide and then it actually comes out again but one thing i hadn't really um fully realized i'm, I'm not an expert on um, biology, yeah, my area is physics, but I've actually um, learnt um, a, a bit about it, and I, so I didn't fully realise um, how many life forms on the Earth are dependent on the tides of the Moon, and um, the, the official term for the gap between high tide and low tide that's called the intertidal uh, region. And there's lots of um, animals live in that region. Uh, mussels, you know, you, you're stuck on, on rocks, crabs. They all live in uh, what's called the intertidal zone. All around the world, there's a huge amount of life lives in the intertidal um, region. And I hadn't fully appreciated how much that is part of the food chain. So hypothetically... If the moon was just bang, just suddenly disappear, the first thing we've noticed is the tides would be much, much less, only about um, 25% of what they are with the moon. Uh, and reason for there still being tides is that the sun also has an influence on the tides. And so the, the sun itself has this squeezing effect on the Earth. And actually creates tides and you might have heard of king tides and and neap tides and so what happens at, at full moon and new moon the the earth the sun and the moon are all uh, in a line you get extra high tides they're king tides and then when the uh, at, at sort of the half moon uh, before and after full moon when the sun, the earth, and the moon at our right angles, then that's the low tide, neap, uh, neap, neap tide. So that, that we noticed that, and then what would happen, the intertidal animals would start to die off because yeah, there's no tide, uh, or the tide's very much reduced. And then the animals that rely on those intertidal animals for food, they, they would start dying because they, they haven't got enough food. Um, um, uh, birds, some, some birds rely on on those animals for food as well, and that would have a big knock-on effect right throughout the food chain of the world, and ultimately it would affect us as human beings, which of course are dependent on the food chain. Do the tides also have other, have other benefits, like the oxygen yeah. that's in the water and so on? Yeah, espe yes, especially in the uh, estuary region. So the estuaries, which are sort of a, a, a special... Um, intertidal case the the health of the estuaries um, is absolutely dependent on the tide so what you've got this sort of flushing effect the water comes in it comes out um, and so that's essential for uh, estuary life as as well so all of those uh, would be affected uh, and there's other things like um, salinity of the oceans as well uh, there's a whole host of um, things that depend on 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 the tides, and, and another one which um, uh, is not generally known is that the the tides are essential for maintaining an equitable climate on 
on, on the earth, depending on where you live in, in the world, where, and especially, uh, you yeah, we hear a lot of news about the hurricanes which affect the eastern seaboard of America, which start uh, in the Atlantic and they, they travel across the ocean, uh, traveling uh, anti, things anti clockwise north of the equator and clockwise south of the equator. And that's due to something called the Coriolis uh, uh, effect. And what it is, because the, you know, the Earth is spinning, and as you appreciate, the equator is moving faster than the higher latitude. So if we were standing on the poles, then we'd only turn once every 24 hours. We'd turn really slowly. But the equator is going around really fast because um, you know, it's 40,000 kilometers around the equator. Yeah, that's right. So um, you know, 24 hours, it goes around 40,000 kilometers. And that means when you get anything, either um, ocean currents or, or the wind, when it moves north of the equator or south of the equator, it goes into a region of the world which is spinning more slowly. And so it's got extra um, um, speed. Again, it's difficult to sort of demonstrate it. But as it comes up from the equator, what's happened, because it goes into a, a, a region which is spinning more slowly, it's going to sort of move, it's going to curve over um, in the in the direction of motion. And that can that effect, that that actually creates the spinning action of a hurricane and the same thing happens to the water so what happens as the earth goes through the tidal bulge because different parts of the earth above and below the equator are spinning at different speeds that causes the water itself to actually spin around so that's where currents come from presumably yeah they could that's right they're called tidal currents and there's points um and, and there's charts that you can see um, on the internet, uh, tidal charts, and they're, they're, you've got these high tide regions around the world, and also you've actually got opposite regions where there's no tide. They're called amphidromic points. And so what it means is the water goes around these amphidromic points. There's one off the coast of uh, Perth, uh, off the off, uh, coast of Western Australia, um, there's one in the uh, southern Pacific, one in the southern um, Atlantic Ocean, uh, and there's some uh, uh, northern latitudes as, as well. And, and those main ones on the, on the south, what they do, they mix cold Antarctic ocean water with the warmer tropical water. The climate of the Earth would be far more extreme, and it's... Uh, calculations um, show that it's, it's possible that some parts of the world would be so hot um, that it'd be unlivable. And also it, it would increase the, uh, um, the colder regions of the world as well, like Antarctica ex expanding. So that, that's what would happen. So if the moon was to suddenly um, disappear, um, there'd be these dire consequences. And again, that, that, that I think that, shows us it, it looks like well to me it, it looks like this is by special design that god has arranged um, um the moon um to um, enable life to exist uh, on the earth at least um um a, a better type of life is our understanding of the moon developing or do we sort of know everything about the moon and, and nothing's been learnt over the last years and some decades or is there still studying going on and we are still growing an understanding of this uh, rock uh, not so far from us yeah that's a good point steve yeah no a huge amount um it's continuing to be um learnt. um lots of spacecraft um have been sent to the moon um the last time people walked on the moon 1972 apollo 17 so that's a long time ago now is that 48 years um although nasa does plan to go back in in 2024 which will be particularly exciting um but the apollo astronauts they they brought back um lots of rocks so several kilograms of of rocks and a lot has been learned about that i'll get onto something um to do with that in a few moments um they left size 
thermometers on the moon for measuring uh, moon quakes. So interesting things have been learned about the interior of the moon. And, and also actually um, learning about the moon has also led to insights into our Earth as well. Um, so there's a sort of um, kind of double whammy effect, I suppose you could call it. Uh, and also um, these laser reflectors have been left on the moon called laser retro reflect reflectors which effectively are like a glorified bike reflectors actually i've heard about these and they use them for working out the speed of light and things like that yeah what they do they um they shine powerful lasers at it if only a few photons come back each time that's enough to actually measure the distance to the moon i think it, uh, about 100 measurements are made every year i think and it's been discovered that the moon is receding from the Earth, not by much, only 3.78 centimetres per year, which I think is about one and a half inches because uh, you know, American websites, they're still, the Americans are still using inches. Um, <clears throat> so it's moving, it's moving um, um, away from the Earth. And at the same time, this is interesting, at the same time, the earth is slowing down again not by much um it's only about 1.78 milliseconds every century okay so um we hardly notice it yeah so what's That's actually um happening uh we've got in fact and, and this is all due to the tides so one thing that's happening if i try and explain this is we've got this tidal bowl dimension, like a balloon in a net. But because of the rotation of the Earth, the actual tidal bulge, because of friction with the Earth itself, actually is rotated forwards. And so the, the bulge is offset from the Earth-Moon axis. And what that bulge, that offset does, what that, that does, it actually pulls the Moon forwards in its orbit it's, it acts like a kind of a spanner it's the thing the physics term is a torque it actually pulls the moon forward in its orbit and that has the effect of actually it's a bit paradoxical it pushes the moon away from the earth um, but in physics there's um there's conservation laws um uh, at local level it's a bit like swings and roundabouts we heard of them you know what you gain on the swings, you lose on the roundabouts or whatever. So it's literally, it, it's kind of like that. And so the fact that the moon is going away from the earth is actually slowing the earth down. In fact, what's happening is the moon is pulling on that tidal bulge and it's acting like a break. And so the moon is slowing down. Now that tells us that in the past, the earth was spinning much faster on its axis um possibly as fast as six hours okay you're saying so because it's been slowing down over many many years yeah that's right so the moon itself has acted like a break and it's actually slowed the rotation down to 24 hours and so the implication is that if there was no moon then the Earth now could be spinning as fast, or the day could only be might only be six hours long. In other words, the Earth spinning six, uh, four times faster than it does. And so we could actually attribute the length. Well, we can length of the day, uh, which is twenty four hours, was a good for us here on the Earth to the Moon. Mm, that's a very interesting concept, particularly when we've got Genesis 1 in mind. Yeah. Um, I won't go there now, though. What I am interested in, um, though, is you've mentioned the, the angle of the Earth, the axis of the Earth a few times. Tell us about the relationship between the axis of the Earth and the Moon. Yep. So that's another very fascinating um, subject. Um, um, and I think most um, listeners will have seen a globe of the earth you know you, you've probably got one at home and all globes if i've never seen one that's different all globes come with a tilt like they're tipping over tilted at, at 23.4 degrees and that's critical for the seasons 
on the earth. You, you must, you have to have a tilt for seasons. If the earth was upright, if it was upright, then everywhere on the earth would have the, the same season. So the equator, it would always be summer. Um, above and below the equator, it would always be like either spring or autumn. And then further north or south still, it'd be permanently winter. So does the moon have an impact on this, on this tilt? It does, yeah. So the moon actually maintains the axis of the Earth within just one degree. So it's 23.4 degrees, and it doesn't go one, it only goes one degree above that and one degree um, below over, over a, a period of several thousand years. And so the actual Earth and the Moon together, they act like a bike wheel. And I think, as we all know, um, you need to be traveling along on a bike to stay upright. As soon as you stop, you get slow, you start wobbling. And then if you stop, you're going to you fall over. And also there's gyroscopes, which are used in navigation. And a spinning gyroscope, they have to keep on spinning. And they maintain their, their, their direction. Go. And so the Earth and the Moon act like a, a, a gyroscope and actually keeps the tilt at 23.4 degrees. Now, if the Moon was to disappear, then what would happen, admittedly over quite a long period of time, but the tilt would no longer be stable and it could go right down. So the North Pole is at the equator and basically it be it would be permanently day on one side of the Earth and then the entire, if it was the North Pole, the entire Southern Hemisphere uh, would become like Antarctica. So basically Australia would be to total frozen block. So that, that's a situation uh, with the moon, that's a fairly recent discovery, 1993. And another thing I would just um, point out is that um, a lot of discoveries about the moon have gone hand in hand with the development of uh, powerful computers. Because a lot of these things you can't do um, without a powerful computer. So with computers, it's possible to ask lots of what if questions. You know, what happened if the moon? Um, disappear. So it's like around simulation yeah. and, and complex equations. Yeah, and that, so that's on. right. These simulations get run for, you know, for millions of years in the past and the um, uh, future. So that, that's what's possible to um, do. And, and just talking about the, the axis of the Earth and the seasons, the, the planets around us also give us um, information. Now, the Earth is one of the four so called rocky planets. The, the planets Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, Neptune those are the uh, gas giants and the ice giants, which are quite different um, to the inner planets. So we've got Mercury closest to the sun, we've got Venus, which is um, next, then us, the Earth, and then we've got Mars. Now, a um, thing about the, about the moon, so the, the moon is 81 times um, smaller than the Earth in terms of the mass. Okay, that, that, that seems like quite a big difference. The Earth is 81 times more massive than the Moon. But the actual, if we take the ratio of the mass of the Moon um, to, to the Earth, that's very, very, very different from any other planet in the solar system. The, the other planets are, are titchy compared to the other moons are titchy compared to their planets and have virtually no influence on the on the actual tilt. So of all of the planets in the solar system, Earth is the only one that's got a large moon. Yeah, exactly right. Well, there's other moons which are larger, like Ganymede, I think it's the largest moon in the solar system, that's Jupiter. But Jupiter is so huge right. that even though Ganymede is larger than our moon, it, it's it's almost nothing compared to Jupiter. So, that, so that, that, that's a critical thing, that our moon is very large in terms of its mass compared to the Earth. If, if something is turning, it's got higher angular momentum, then it's more difficult 
to actually um, actually turn the axis of rotation. So that's the critical aspect. It's uh, because of the size of the moon, um, it contains most of the uh, angular momentum of the Earth-Moon system, and it makes our orbit, uh, the orbit of the Earth, the tilt, resistant to change. Now, with the other planets, Mercury, that's almost perfectly um, upright. Yeah, you know, it's only sort of point oh three of a degree, I think, from upright. So that that's got no seasons whatsoever. Venus is really, really interesting. Venus actually rotates opposite to all the other planets. If you you look down on the solar system from the north, say from the north pole of the Earth, look down, and the planets. Um, go around the sun anti-clockwise and they rotate on their axis anti-clockwise. Venus goes around anti-clockwise around the sun, but on its axis, it rotates clockwise. It's in reverse. And what is thought is that the Venus has actually has flipped over on its axis. It's actually, it's actually going around the sun upside down. And I think a distinct possibility is that it's that the Venus with no moon that over the years, because of actual instability, is actually flipped over. So it's an actual example of what can happen when you don't have a moon. Now, Mars on the other side of us, uh, it's about one and a half times further away from the sun um, than we are. That's got two tiny little moons, Phobos and, and Deimos. You may have seen pictures of them. But they, they look like sort of uh, knobbly potatoes. And they're really small, only a few kilometres across. And they have virtually zero influence on Mars. And studies of Mars have shown that the axis of Mars, although it's 25 degrees at the moment, which is similar to the Earth, it's changed from 60 to zero degrees in the past, which has led to um, uh, dramatic changes in the climate, which has probably contributed it to, uh, contributed to Mars uh, becoming um, a desert, along with other uh, other things as well, like no magnetic um, field. So we can almost, uh, to my mind, use the planets either side of the Earth as kind of like bookings. Uh, and, and our Earth is in an ideal position, which is called the Goldilocks zone, and that's an official astrophysics term. If you Google it, you will actually see that in, you know, the Journal of Astrophysics or whatever. They actually use Goldilocks being it was just right. Yeah, as in three bears, so not too hot, not too cold, but just right. Venus is just uh, um, uh, beyond the Goldilocks zone, uh, close to the Sun, and, and Mars is just on the on the. On, on, on the outer edge. So the fact that these two planets are so different, Venus um, is extremely hot, in fact, due to what's called the runaway greenhouse effect. And people are worried about, as you probably know, a lot of um, discussion at the moment about keeping the increase in the temperature of the Earth to below 1.5 degrees, because there's a, a danger, well, admittedly, it's sort of unknown, but um, well, uh, there, there's good reasons for thinking that uh, what would happen if the temperature of the Earth does go beyond a certain level, then control could be lost and dump the 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 the, the, um, the temperature just skyrockets as has happened. So it would reach like a tipping point where it would then escalate. Yeah, that's um, that's right. Like what I mean, very cruelly. Um, increase in temperature that increases the amount of water in the atmosphere. Water is actually a greenhouse gas, and so that would so that would accelerate. So it gets hotter. There's more water in the atmosphere that makes the Earth even warmer, and so it gets hotter, hotter, and hotter. Stephen, famously in 1969, of course, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin from Apollo 11 walked on the moon. Um, beyond that, I'm not exactly sure how many people actually walked on the moon. Um, but, of course, there was a number of Apollo missions, and you mentioned uh, 17 being the last yeah. one. Uh, famously, 13 is probably the one everyone knows about because of the movie, yeah. uh, and it is a great movie if, if you haven't seen it. Um, you know, I think you mentioned Apollo 17 was in 1972, which was uh, 48 years ago. 
Um, I hadn't realised that there was plans to go back to the moon. That sounds interesting. What do you know about that and why would they be considering it? What's the benefit and what do you think we can learn further about the moon? Yeah, so um, NASA plans to go back to the moon in 2024. It's called the Artemis mission. If you, you Google it, um, you'll see lots of a- animations. And the idea is to actually have a, a kind of a gateway space station going around the moon. And so people will travel from the Earth to this gateway station and then drop down to the surface of the of the moon. So that's planned. In fact, a lot of people think it's um, it's high time that human beings went back to the moon. That it's actually it's a, a travesty that uh, human beings have not gone back. In fact, um, there were three. Uh, uh, I, I think it's. Um, in fact, I think you 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 actually hit the nail on the head when you said that most people know about the Apollo missions from Apollo thirteen. In fact, I think, uh, but Apollo twelve they struggled to get the public interested um, in 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 that mission. If I, I think, if I remember rightly, I think they may have even dropped various transmissions. In, in favor of um, you know just regular programming, it's almost like okay, we've been there, done that, and uh, so there, there was waning interest. But when Apollo thirteen came along and they didn't get to the moon, and and uh, that that would probably have the greatest um, uh, coverage. In fact, I think it was it Eugene Cernan or, or or Chris Craft, one of the um, NASA people considers Apollo 13 as the greatest achievement, even greater than Apollo 11, the fact they did manage to get the, um, the astronauts um, back. And there were three other Apollo missions planned, but they got cut, it's budget cuts. And, and, and also you have to, I suppose, you have to realise it's the end of the, coming up to the end of the Vietnam era, although one figure I heard when when you consider the cost of space travel compared to military spending it's it's really is peanuts and i've not i haven't checked verified this but apparently the the apollo 11 mission the cost of that was equal to two weeks spending on the vietnam war people think it's high time to go back to the moon uh but there's lots of um interesting questions the the moon rocks that were brought back from the Apollo missions actually threw a spanner in the works on theories about the formation of the moon. When by analysing moon rocks, you'd expect to find a difference between the composition of the moon and the composition of the Earth. But what was discovered is that essentially the moon is exactly the same composition of the Earth that was done using the isotopes of titanium, isotopes of titanium, a metal and and oxygen. You can actually use isotopes like fingerprints, and so this is really quite a difficult problem. In fact, if you actually look up the theory hypothesis called the giant impact hypothesis on the internet, uh, when you look at the problems, it looks like uh, one of these Euler's you know, end user license agreements. There's so many problems actually um, um, listed. And I, I think from a from a faith point of view, that's really, really uh, in, interesting. Because it's okay, it's really difficult to explain how the moon got to where it is. So it's, uh, it's just the, the right size and the, and, and the mass. And another thing we could look at, how come is it that the moon is an exact fit to the sun? It's, it, the moon's exactly 400 times smaller than the sun in terms of the diameter, but also exactly 400 times closer to the Earth than the sun. So it's a perfect match, uh, which we see when, when we see, although quite rarely, at any one given point on the Earth, when there's a total solar eclipse, the, the moon is an exact match to the sun. And is that significant in terms of sort of physics or how we live on, on the Earth? Yeah, uh, well, it, it is because um, that 
fact in itself has actually led to scientific discoveries. And one thing that um, happens when the the moon covers the sun perfectly, it actually it covers the bright surface, which is known as the photosphere. And because that's covered, we can actually see the glowing atmosphere of the sun called the corona. We talk about atmosphere, that's all the gas around the sun. Okay, it's not, you know, you can breathe it like an atmosphere on the earth, but it's all the gas um, around the sun. And that, that glows with the light because it is excited by the light which comes from the photosphere. But because the photosphere is now covered, then that doesn't block, that doesn't interfere. The light from the corona, in fact, it's got a special name, it's called the flash spectrum. The flash spectrum, that actually gives us uh, an idea of what is in the sun. There's other, other things as well, but it's more difficult to get information. And in particular, helium was first discovered in the sun. In fact, it's called helium. It's named after Helios, the, the Greek name for the, for the sun. Of course, the sun is the most massive body in our solar system. And actually, the sun, because of its very strong gravity, actually affects starlight traveling close to it. And what it actually does, it's a bit, in fact, a good analogy, Steve, it's like um, on a trampoline. If you're on a, on a, on a trampoline, the trampoline actually gets um, bent. And if you imagine, if you're sitting on a trampoline, and someone throws a ball into the trampoline, the ball might actually travel around you because it travels on the curve of the trampoline. Another good example um, in shopping centres where you, you, you roll a coin into a funnel. You've seen those and you know, it rolls around and drops in a, a hole in, in the bottom. So it's like that. And so um, the sun actually curves the space around it. And so what actually happens when, when starlight comes past the sun, because of that curved path, the actual starlight kinks inwards. And when we see it on the Earth, it looks like the stars are actually further away from the sun than they would otherwise be if the sun wasn't there. And that verified Einstein's theory of general relativity. Uh, firstly, in 1919, and then in 1922, uh, with an Australian eclipse. So that, that confirmed that. And so without total solar eclipses, um, uh, it would not be possible to discover that, or at least it, you know, it might have been discovered very much um, later. And so I think that is quite a remarkable thing. So of all of the moons in a solar system, we've got this perfect match between the moon and the sun and that has enabled um, scientific discoveries which otherwise could not have been made or at least it would have been a lot more difficult and and some actual uh, christian scientists um, have actually gone further and said not only does the universe look like it's been especially designed for life but the earth has been especially positioned in the universe for us to actually find out that the universe has been especially designed for life. That's very interesting. I, I probably We probably need to draw our thoughts to a close, but I did want to ask you uh, one question. It's an unfair question, I've got to admit, um, and I know you're not going to have the answer, but I'd be really interested in your opinion. Yeah. Um, you would be no doubt familiar with Joshua's battle with the Amorites, and it says in yeah. Joshua chapter 10 yeah. that, on the day that the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of Ajalon. And so my question to you, Stephen, is did the moon actually stand still, and how could that possibly happen? Okay, uh, interesting question, Steve. Um, well, I um, believe in the record of the Bible, and so I think from the point of view of those at that battle the sun literally did stand still uh, and and also the moon now as to whether you know the the the, the sun actually stopping in the side of the moon well of course as i think everyone knows um it's not actually the sun that is moving it's the 
due to the rotation of the Earth. And so the question would have to be, you know, did the Earth itself actually stop moving? And, and did the moon actually stop in its orbit going around the Earth? Well, I don't think um, that the Earth did literally stop, although, of course, um, God has infinite power, so could actually do that. Or, or, and I don't think the moon actually stopped in its tracks. Personally, I think what actually what God did was to actually... Um, I mean, I might be wrong about this. This is my personal opinion that God actually used the physics of general relativity to actually bend the sunlight and the and and the moonlight, and so um, the light was progressively bent. And so, uh, you know, in the same way that in an eclipse of stars, although this is a very small amount, the stars change their position. That God actually bent. Um, of uh, course, uh, space time, as we call it, to actually be curved in a certain way. And so it altered the course of sunlight and also altered the course of the the moonlight. I mean, that, that's not so far-fetched because um, um, this, this happens anyway. When we actually look at the stars in the night sky, um, they're not actually where we see them. They're actually their position is slightly different due to something called refraction in the atmosphere. Now, I don't, Steve, we noticed um, um, uh, when the uh, uh, full moon, when the moon rises or at sunset, sunrise, the, the moon or the sun actually looks an oval shape. That is due to atmospheric refraction. Um, and so the actual, the moon itself is compressed and the sun is compressed in a vertical direction, but stays the same width. Um, and, and in the actual um, uh, Antarctic um, regions, you know, where you've got six months of nighttime, six months of daylight, sunrise, I think um, this is uh, recorded by, uh, it might have been Scott, sunrise occurred, like they were calculating when the sun comes back for the first time. You know, you've got six months of night, and then it comes back for the first time, and they were three days out. And so sunrise occurred three days earlier. Now, actually, um, it did, although you know, it looked like it occurred three days earlier, actually it didn't. The sun was still below the horizon, but because of atmospheric refraction, the rays of the sun were actually bent over the horizon or bent um, down a bit. So it actually, it, it actually appeared uh, so, as if... So you're sun... seeing the sun below the horizon line. Yeah, that, yeah. that's right, yeah. Um, and so that, that's, that's an example where um, the sun... So in the, like in the case of this Valley of Agilon, um, you can admit it's a bit like that, that the sun um, actually had set, and yet it was still in the sky. So the actual light got bent over... Horizon. So that, that, that's my personal take on it. Stephen, I wanted to finish with the fact that the moon is signif significant in the Bible. Um, obviously, the months are based on the moon, the, the lunar months, uh, the Hebrew calendar, all of the festivals, of course, were set around the moon in terms of its timing and, and so on. And that takes our minds back to Genesis 1 as well. Um, but there's an interesting fact, um, which... I don't know actually when people would have actually known this, like how long ago it would have been discovered. But of course, the moon is not a light source like the sun. The moon actually reflects the, the, the light from the sun. And so for, for us looking at it from the earth, it looks like it's shining light. But in fact, it's not a light source. This idea is picked up on in scripture. Have you got any thoughts on that and how the moon's used in the Bible from that point of view? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, because in when you, know, you study the Bible, that the the night sky is used as a, a metaphor of what's on the earth. There's a <clears throat> verse in Isaiah where um, uh, God, through the prophet, tells the people that "Hear, O heavens!" Um, but, but I'm paraphrasing the, 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 for the people. Um, to hear God's word, they call the heavens and the earth, and the heavens represents the rulers, and the um, 
and, and the earth represents the represents the um, people. And when we study the Bible, we've got the, uh, the the sun represents the secular powers, and the moon represents ecclesiastical powers, which gain their authority from the sun. And that's 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 the kind of um, I think an accurate way of looking at it, because the sun uh, is the source of light in the solar system, and the the moon it lights the night sky as we are all familiar with. And another thing we didn't actually mention in our discussion, um, moonlight is actually essential for um, the hunting of many predators, like owls and that. That if uh, if the moon disappeared, then that would wreak havoc uh, with the with the nighttime animals. So, so a, a vast amount of the creation is actually dependent on the on the moon at night. And so, basically, I suppose at, at a basic level, it's like taking a bit of the sun and projecting it onto the earth at night. In fact, literally, it's, it's kind of like that. So the, the moon is like a a, a mirror. Um, and it bounces sunlight onto uh, onto the earth at, at night. So that's a really, I think it's, it's a good metaphor for different levels of government where you've got sort of the main government and then you've got these uh, lower levels um, like religious authorities um, in the moon, which are, are, sorry, religious authorities on the earth um, and the metaphor used in, 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 in scripture for them actually uh, getting power, which is kind of reflected off the, the, the main the main body. Stephen, it's been great to talk to you. Thanks for speaking with Wilderness Conversations. Thanks.